Was the board game based off of the movie that was based off a roller coaster ride? Or was the board game based off of the roller coaster ride that was then based off of a movie? Or was the movie based off of the roller coaster ride? Or was the board game based off of the roller coaster ride that then based off of the movie? I can't keep up with this Disney crap anymore. Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about Disney's The Haunted Mansion Call of the Spirits. Now, this game is based off of a roller coaster ride in the Disney theme park, which is based off of a movie, or the movie was based off of... Anyways, there's an Eddie Murphy movie called The Haunted Mansion that is based off of the roller coaster ride. So, the board game is somehow tied into the movie or the roller coaster. I have not been on the roller coaster ride, nor have I seen the Eddie Murphy movie. So, I have played the board game, and so we're going to talk about it because it is a Prospero Hall board game, and if you guys do or don't know, I've been doing just as much as I can to just play everything that Prospero Hall does and see whether if I like it or whether if I don't like it. So far, they've had a pretty good track record, but that might be shattered today. So let's take a look at the game, and then I'll tell you more about Prospero Hall and my thoughts. Welcome to Disney's Haunted Mansion Call of the Spirits. And players are going to be going around the mansion. There's the board here, and you're going to be talking with spirits or ghosts you'll be collecting them and it's a set collection game you'll be getting points based on how many ghosts that you can collect now i want to point out a few things just in regards to setup you'll put the board out this does have a hole in the middle of it which you will fill in with what they call the endless hallway and it kind of sits in there and well does a little spinny action oops i'm trying not to and so it kind of spins around and then you will place your figurines. I have three for like a three player game. This is what's called the seance room. And that's where you start your, your game. Next for in regards to setup is you are going to shuffle the haunt cards. The haunt cards are these tiny, tiny, tiny cards. You will shuffle these. They all have a numerical value of one, two, or three. So you will somehow shuffle these up and place them oops, next to the board. And so the second thing that you're going to do is you are going to take the ghost cards right here and you're gonna shuffle the ghost cards, but I wanna show them off to you. And so this ghost here, each ghost has a certain type. And then this ghost is three points. If you have one of him, if you have two of him, you get zero. If you have three of him, you get 12. So it's kind of a risk, high risk, high reward thing. If you get two, you're stuck. But if you get that third one, you're rolling. So you will shuffle the ghost cards and place them face down next to the board. The last thing you're gonna do is take the event cards now it depends on how many players you have. You're gonna take that many out randomly without looking at it. So a three player game, we're gonna take three cards out of the game. You're also gonna find the final ending card. Uh, there we go, final round. And that's gonna be buried somewhere between the bottom four cards. You will then mix these up, shuffle. This is my universal sign for shuffling. And then place these on top. After everyone has taken a turn, you will then flip over a card for the, for the round. Now, what does this mean? This is going to be, there's these walking, wandering ghosts, and they start the game in the crypt. And these kind of translucent 
uh, figurines here. They start in the crypt, and at the end of, or sorry, at the start of every round, you will flip over a c event card, and this says that they go three spots clockwise. So they would move uh, one, two, three. And that's that. So that's for the event cards. When you do get down somewhere to that final round, that will be triggering the final round. Now, let's talk about the Endless Hallway. You have three points that you can use to spend on your turn. One is to move, obviously, and you can move from the seance room. I'm going to be yellow. I'm going to be this yellow, like, bat figurine and um, move into this room. Now your figurines will never actually go into the rooms. They're either gonna be in the seance room or the endless hallway. But for all intents and purposes, my character, figurine, whatever, is considered in this room while I'm in this spot. That's what you can do for one action. I could one action to move out to this hallway. I could use another action to move over here or another action to move back and then here, but you get three actions. Another thing you can do for your action is you can spin the wheel, the best part, right? Now it only costs one action to move it however many times that you want. So you can put it wherever, wherever you want. I can move it to there. So it only takes one action to move the hallway as many times as you want. Basically, there's some other actions that I'm not going to go deep into. You can fight other players. They do have some dials here in which you'll secretly pick numbers and whatever the number you pick is how many haunt cards that you will take. The haunt cards are bad. They're negative cards. And so you'll be going around at the end of every round and you'll be placing ghosts in particular rooms. I'm just kind of throwing them out. But there'll be ghosts in certain rooms and you'll be going there and for an action you can take that card if you're in that room and you place it in front of you building a tableau. At the end of the game, you are going to be adding up these nasty haunt cards. Threes, threes, oh I got all threes here. So whoever has the highest of these haunts, I'm going to put them down because I'm going to end up just dropping them. Whoever has the highest value of haunts is going to take the highest number of ghost cards and discard them. So it's like, yeah, good job. You collected a bunch of ghosts, but you were incredibly risky or you did a lot of things to collect haunt cards to get all those. So basically it's kind of a way to punish the winner or who is probably going to win because they just did all these things and, and collected haunt cards willy nilly, not even really caring. Now how you collect haunt cards, if I'm in this room, and the wandering ghosts move through my room, I have to collect a haunt card. If they end their turn in my room, I have to collect two haunt cards. If there is a ghost that I want in the same room with the wandering ghosts, I have to, in order to take this, I have to spend an action, and, you guessed it, I also have to take a haunt card. So that is how you get haunt cards. At the end of the game, like I said, whoever has the most numerical values of haunt cards is going to get rid of the most numbered cards that they have, basically weakening. So from what I've seen in this game, whoever has the most haunt cards is just not going to win the game. So there is a little bit of kind of risk management involved in the game in regards to playing bold, going after ghosts, but then also trying to avoid haunt cards. Now there's a way for you to get rid of haunt cards and things like that, but I'm not gonna get into every single thing. Like I said, there's a way for you to fight and steal cards from each other. But essentially, this is the setup. You put your board out, you put your little spinny dial out, you're gonna grab your figurines that are these things, and you'll be just playing and flipping over cards until you hit the final round. At the final round, Whoever has the most points for the cards after you've done the whole haunt thing is the winner of the game. Well, okay then. If you haven't been able to tell already, Disney's The Haunted Mansion Call of Spirits is a children's game. The box says that it's for eight-year-olds and up. Yes, eight-year-olds, dude. And... 
it's really not a great family game. So I wanted to talk about this because of the Prospero Hall stamp on it. That's why I kind of got it, uh, got a copy of the game, and I wanted to just get through everything. I've actually been on the Prospero Hall's website, and I've scrolled through looking for, like, what game haven't I played? What game haven't I played? You know, I, oh, I could review this. Um, this is a pretty epic failure, in my opinion, for a few reasons. First of all, this, well, I'll start with the small ones, and then I'll kind of get to the big, the big one. The, first of all, the small one is, it's really just a set collection game. You just want to get two purples. If you get one purple ghost, you get two points. If you get two purple ghosts, you get seven points. Raw, yeah. Or there's some that are like, if you get two point, if you get one, you get two points. If you get two, you get zero points. But if you get three, you get 12 points. You know, so it's like, ooh, risk reward kind of thing. Can I, will that ghost come out? Will I be able to get three of them? Because one of them is kind of worthless and two of them is literally worthless. This has been done to death. If you are looking for a set collection game in this vein, I would recommend a game called Dream Home. It, it plays kind of the same where you're trying to build stories of your house by laying cards down and if you put like living rooms next to kitchens or kitchens next to bathrooms or bedrooms next to bathrooms, you get points for collecting basically essentially colored cards just like what we have in this game. The second thing is the action point allowance system is pretty much Prospero Hall's bread and butter at this juncture. Um, and that's fine. That's fine. I don't know if that's really fine. That's fine, essentially. But it's, you get your three points, your turn's done, it's simple. The second thing, on to number two, the haunt cards are incredibly, as you saw and I commented, tiny. I'm talking tiny. Actually, I'll probably show you a little comparison of how small these cards are compared to a quarter. They are unnecessarily small. Like legitimately, like unnecessarily small. Like tiny, little, like less than the size of my ear cards. They're novelties. Are you gonna sit around and be playing cards with these cards? Probably not. Uh, they're just a novelty. They're just for fun, for something that's kind of silly if, that you want to give someone. That's essentially it. And these cards, the hunt cards, are just as small, if not smaller, than those stupid, fake, little, silly, novelty poker cards. And I don't understand the design choice on this. I really don't. The components, no good. The figurines, as you saw, they're these, like, bat things with wings. I... Don't care. I really don't care. I wish they would have had individual little people. Instead, we're all the same little figurine, just different colors, which is fine. Um, you might have a colorblind issue there, and you know the board game community has always been sensitive to colorblind people by putting symbols on different things like reds and greens and yellows or whatever. But we're all the same, different colors. We're these big winged things, and it would have been cool to be like. Uh, another game of theirs called Horrified, where you could pick a person, and you could have a little figurine, little miniature of your person. That would have been kind of cool. I mentioned when I was playing this game with some other people that I looked down and just looked at my figurine and was like, "Ugh, I don't even know what that is. It's like this bat-winged creature. I don't, I don't like it. I just, I really don't like the figurines in it. The way that the cards work." been done to death. I've already recommended another game. The miniatures, I don't necessarily really care for. I honestly don't. The cards, the haunt, the haunt cards are an absolute abomination. Abomination. There's no reason to have cards this small. None. Absolutely no reason to have cards this small. You couldn't even just do the fantasy flight, like the somewhat small, like they have an X-Wing and like Arkham Horror and stuff. The No, these are even like smaller. There is no reason for this. No reason. And I know people are going to probably comment like, well, price point, it's less, 
it's less material, so less product, so it costs less. I don't care. If they added an extra half inch onto these cards, I don't think it would have mattered much. I'm not in the design business. I'm in the YouTube business, but I don't care. I don't, I don't care. I don't think it would have mattered that much in regards to price point. Now let's get to number three, which is the biggest one of all. So you get past the small cards, okay? Throw that aside. You get past the miniature that's this creepy bat winged thing that doesn't feel personal, doesn't feel like you're, you're supposed to be like a human, right? Going through this thing? I don't know. I don't know the lore of this game. I don't know the, I just don't know. A lot of great family games that you can play with kids, which is great. So you might be thinking like, ah, oh, you're hating on it because it's a kid's game. I actually have quite a few games that I enjoy that play lower age levels, eight, nine, 10 years old, that I really enjoy, that I sit around this table that I'm at right now and play with all of my adult friends. As not to be confused with my non-adult friends. And so what makes a great family game is that adults can enjoy it too. I'm gonna hearken this to the early Pixar movies before Disney, again, we're talking about Disney, before Disney took over, there were some Pixar movies that were made for kids, like Finding Nemo and Wall-E. They were made for kids, but adults could watch them and adults could really take something from the movie. Finding Nemo is essentially about being a, a father or about be being a parent. So adults can watch it and they can kind of identify with the Marlin character and kids can watch it because like the Dory character is silly and you come across some some sharks and stuff and hello my name's bros and so it really is an amalgamation of entertainment for kids and adults this game here i'll hold it up this is just a kid's game it's flat out flat out a kid's game i would not enjoy this i would probably play it with some kids but i would not enjoy it while i was playing it the kids sure as heck could enjoy it. I'm not going to step on anyone's enjoyment of a game. If you have this game and you enjoy it, good on you, mate. But for me and Prospero Hall, to quote from The Godfather, we're quits. We're quits. I mean, I'm being sarcastic, but this one was a big swing and a miss. So Prospero Hall, great looking game other than the components that I've already talked about, but it seems just so simplistic, and there's a lot of that collecting sets of cards to get points. This game just hits for kids. It really does. I didn't care for it. The other adults that I played it with, they were all just kind of nonplussed. So, Prospero Hall, swing and a miss, guys. Swing and a miss on this one. I really would not recommend picking up Disney, The Haunted Mansion. Oh yeah, I forgot. Call of the Spirits is the full title of it. I would not recommend picking it up unless if you actually do have eight-year-olds that you want to, that would enjoy playing the game. So anyways, that's all from me on this video for today. Thank you everyone for watching. Once again, my name is Andrew Davidson. You've been watching As Per My Ability and I will see you guys at the next video. I think the roller coaster ride would be more fun than than this game. And I hate roller coaster rides. Scare the bejesus out of me.